I'm Gil Reich. I'm privileged to work as a data engineer with the amazing data science team at Wix. Wix has a website builder. Organizations of all types and sizes use us to run their online businesses and create their online presences. About 10% of the world's websites are on Wix, and we are heavy Airflow users. So thank you, everybody in the Airflow community for making Airflow so amazing. Our story takes place inside our site classification project. We look at all of the Wix sites, and we say, this is a blog, this is a photography portfolio, this is a pet store, et cetera. And this is done, we do this by running eight Airflow DAGs every day. Every morning, a daily orchestrator runs, and it runs, on a, it runs a pipeline of seven internal DAGs. Each internal DAG takes the output from the previous DAG, stores that daily output in its own permanent tables for its own needs, and also passes the daily output table on to the next internal DAG. And our story begins, at least this is how it begins when I tell it, when I inherited this impressive, working, important, complicated project, and there were more than 100 files in the site classification folder. I have to admit that I made things worse before I made things better, because when I inherited the project, I think there were five internal DAGs. When I added the next two, I copied and pasted existing working code. In the short term, that's the fastest and safest way to get new functionality working without breaking old functionality, especially if you barely understand Airflow and don't really understand yet how this stuff is working. Obviously, in the long term, that's a disaster. And this was really a classic case of, of accumulating technical debt. And, and the worst part of technical debt is that it's, it's repaid in compound interest. That is, the worse the code gets, the more dangerous and scary it is to make modifications to it. So it just gets worse. So you have to, at some point, stop and, and get things back together. And that's what we did. Our guiding principles were reduce duplicate code, abstract away ugliness and complexity, short, simple functions. I like classes, not everybody does. Uh, separate the business logic, the config, and the technical implementation. Separate specific code from code that could be shared, and start small. What we did, we attacked six problems. The first, and this is the first not only because it was by far the biggest, but also because until you deal, until we dealt with the duplicate and near duplicate code, we couldn't really do anything else. That is, you, you don't want to make optimizations or fixes or improvements on multiple copies of, of code. So first, we needed to get the duplicate and uh, near duplicate problem under control. Started with some simple refactorings. Here was the, the most egregious one. The way the code evolved, we wound up with 20 to 30 places where we were appending the same long, ugly Jinja template to all our daily table names. Okay, now the nice things about this is that these are the easiest problems to fix. This is the lowest hanging fruit. You just, you just extract that into a variable and everything's great. And so there were a bunch of refactorings we were able to do on the variable levels, on class level, on function levels, et cetera, and that made things better. It was a good start, but it wasn't nearly enough. We had to start taking it next on the file level. So I mentioned before that we have a daily orchestrator. We also have a monthly orchestrator and a backfill slash ad hoc orchestrator. And the problem is that each was created, each had its own file creating it, defining it. And now, in fairness, there was a lot of shared code called from these files, but still, there was far too much duplicate and near duplicate code. And our goal was to reorganize this so that we had an orchestrator, one single orchestrator object and file, and have that infer the, uh, build the orchestrators from the config. So we built a config. This is a simplified version. It's, it gets a little more complicated. But so the orchestrator section of the site classification config file, we define that we have a daily orchestrator, which runs at 3.30 every morning, and a monthly orchestrator, which runs at 11 o'clock on the first of the month, and a backfill slash ad hoc orchestrator that is unscheduled and is triggered manually. Again, there, there are more configuration differences. I'm just showing a little bit to give you the idea. And, and that worked. We now have single orchestrator class. 
which builds orchestrators based on the configuration in site class config. Inspired, <laughs> encouraged by our success there, we took on the bigger problem of the seven internal DAGs. Now the seven internal DAGs, they did a lot of similar things. There was a lot of share, there was some shared code calling shared functions. There was far too much duplicate code. And so we wanted to do, and we succeeded in doing, was creating a DS DAG object, DS because it was created by the data science group, and have that shared code in the DS DAG object and have that shared code called by the site classification create DAGs file to create all the DAGs and their tasks using configurations from the site classification config file. So I will give you two examples of things that we did there. Before, we had code that looked somewhat like this in most of our things. The um, first to trigger a model, we called a, uh, a Python operator and sent it a bunch of parameters. And then we called a Python sensor to wait for that model to finish. And then we call, uh, created another Python operator and sent another bunch of parameters to run our validation code. Okay, that's a fairly standard thing, and it was in most of our DAGs. At the end of the day, we were able to do this all. We have basically one function call on the DSDAG object that uh, creates all these tasks. And in most cases, we don't even have to send it any parameters because we've standardized things well enough and we've gone through the config file well enough that just that one simple function call is able to create the three tasks. And additionally, we added an output ready empty task and I'll show you why a little bit later. Just uh, one second example is for store results. I mentioned that each of the internal DAGs stores its own results. And so one simple function call creates six tasks and even creates these cute little labels for the branching operator. And I'll mention about the cute little labels is that when you have control, when you're doing one DAG at a time, it's, it's, it's easier to cut corners or it's harder to inspire yourself to, to really do all the things you're supposed to do right, to really do all the best practices. But when you're writing code that's going to be used by many different DAGs, it, uh, it's more inspiring, at least for me, to put in the work to do all the details and do, uh, do everything uh, as right as you can. We have, just, just beginning, so started with, with three classes. We now have a bunch more classes, but we have a DAG manager class, which is one instance per project, and that manages all the shared settings, the config, et cetera. We use that to create each DS DAG object. We have one instance per internal DAG, and we have an orchestrator class that derives from the DS DAG task. It's a type of DAG, and we have one instance per orchestrator. Here's a simple config section for one of the internal DAGs. It has the model ID, it has some table and field names. It only has to put things where we diverge from the defaults. Things that are done by the defaults often can just be generated uh, automatically. And I want to point out the essence statement. That's the one line of documentation that was written manually. And we will then use that essence statement. I'll show you how we use that essence statement in various places when we auto-generate documentation. We leverage that one statement to really make the auto-generated documentation useful. Putting it all together, in, in one of our simpler internal DAGs, it's written by that config and these four lines of code. Okay, we tell the DAG manager to create the DAG using that section of the config file. We tell it to create a create table task using this SQL ID. I'm not gonna get into our, the SQLs, but we have a place to write the SQLs and give them IDs, and, and so we call that. We tell it to create the run model tasks. We tell it to create the store results tasks, and these four lines of code with that configuration create this whole DAG. Putting that all together, whereas the av our average internal DAG before this was uh, over 200 lines spread out all, sort all, all over the place, we now have it organized as about 25 lines in the site classification, create, da create DAGs, config, and SQLs, and the rest is in the shared DSDAG framework where it's written once and not multiple times. Okay, now that we did that, we could start to get to other problems that we had along the way that were waiting <laughs> until we had control of our code. So ad hoc runs always got difficult, but once we are implementing this, so we're able to, we load the config through the Airflow's params mechanism, and so now everything can just go through when you trigger DAG with params, you can change any of the values, 
you can only run some of the pipeline, and we even extracted out that one specific uh, store results checkbox. If you remember, when I showed you the new task store results function call, it uh, creates a branch operator check if store output, and the, re the reason for that is to look at this, uh, this checkbox. If the user is running the DAG with that parameter off, it will take the bottom path of don't store output, because often on ad hoc runs, sometimes ad hoc runs, you want to really do everything right, and often on ad hoc runs, you're just testing things for some reason, and you don't want to manipulate your permanent tables. Third problem, too slow. Or more specifically, our customers wanted our results in the morning, and we were giving them the results late in the afternoon. And this wound up being an easy problem to solve once we had control of our DAGs. So the old way, the orchestrator was waiting for each DAG to complete before moving on to the next DAG. And if you remember, the last section of the DAG is storing the results. There's no reason for the orchestrator to wait for the DAG to store its results in permanent tables before moving on to the next DAG. So we moved the sensor to be on the output ready task instead of on the DAG itself. And to follow that up in the orchestrator, so now in addition to going through all the DAGs the pipeline wants, which is now set that, each, that the next DAG will run after the previous DAG's wait, uh, output ready, empty task ran. Uh, and then at the end, we again have all seven DAGs listed, which is each one now just a sensor for the DAG itself so that we know when the DAGs are really completed. So if anything happens in store results or whatever, we stop, we don't drop the temp tables, and, uh, and I know there was a failure. Problem four, local testing. Uh, I'm embarrassed to say that before we made these changes, local testing was a dangerous nightmare. We were using the same config, same table names, when running locally as we were when running on production which meant that if you wanted to test, you needed to go into the source code and change all your table names and comment out certain tasks maybe and then hope that you got everything and then hope that after you tested, you put everything back and didn't, change, didn't check in any things into master and also hope that you, in all this stuff, you actually tested the things you want to test, whatever. It's a nightmare. Once we had control, we were able to integrate some local config things. So for example, we look at when we're reading and writing tables, we say, does it start with prod dot or sandbox dot? If it does, replace that with sandbox dot gilar underscore. And obviously anybody could replace it with, with whatever strings they want, and it will run on that. And therefore, it won't overwrite, it won't integrate with any of our production tables. At the same time, we said, when we're testing, we don't need to run on tens of millions of rows. 10,000 rows is enough, so our, our SQL manager knows to uh, append that limit to all SQLs that it's running when we're on a local environment, when it detects that we're on the local environment. Problem five, documentation. And I have to admit, this is my favorite part. <laughs> Most of us agree that documentation is important. Most of us don't like writing documentation, or we do like, like writing documentation, but it's just not the most urgent task at the moment, and we'll get to it later. So Airflow provides a beautiful way of displaying documentation once it's written. The problem is writing it, and so we take care of that for you. Let me say right off the bat, this is not Gen AI. This is while we're creating the, while the framework is creating the DAG and the tasks, it can also create the documentation, okay? It's not Gen AI, there are no hallucinations. You can rely on this documentation to be accurate. So we have a, uh, a default template with uh, the internal DAGs, and when the framework runs, it resolves the template. You may remember I told you that I, we have the essence in the DAG config and that we would use it for the documentation. Well, here it is. The more info is any other assets that we change along the way. For example, I, we, I mentioned that we store results to these different tables. So all of that gets automatically added to the top of the documentation so that anybody looking at the DAG can immediately know what it does and what it writes to, et cetera. And it continues, so just those three lines of code in the, excuse those, those three lines of text in the template then resolves into this whole list of, tag, uh, of tasks. 
including descriptions for them, including all of the names, the model ID and the table names all filled out. Again, not Gen AI, templates and texts written manually and resolved and prepared by the framework. My favorite part of the documentation section is the auto-generated documentation, is, sorry, is that uh, we list all the libraries and scripts used. So we show you for each task what function created it, linking to the GitHub source code. We even show you how the documentation is created. It, uh, in addition, you can go into the SQL section. We will show you the SQL source code. So it's all automatically generated. The orchestrator has its own default template where in addition to everything you saw before, it writes all the internal DAGs, linking to them, giving their essences. And finally, it gives a list of all the assets that were modified by the orchestrator itself or any of the internal DAGs run by the orchestrator, including which internal DAG modified each asset. Last problem, our other projects need this too. We were very happy with what we did for the site classification project, but as I mentioned, we are fairly heavy users of Airflow, although after spending three days at this conference, I realized that there are organizations that use Airflow a lot heavier than we do. But even in our limited use of Airflow, uh, this was a big number for us, and uh, we wanted to be able to use this on other projects. So we decoupled the DSDAG framework from the site classification project so that this can be reused throughout the organization and beyond. I use the DSDAG framework for all of my DAGs, even when I'm just writing a single DAG, which should be simple, just to get the, uh, the auto documentation, just to get the, uh, the local config changes in there. And, and frankly, when I do it, it's also to, you know, to eat my own dog food so that I can see how it works and, and keep expanding the framework. We're also providing the framework externally. It does, it's not productized for external use. We're providing it so that you can use it, look at it, copy it, whatever. You probably need to modify it for your own uses. If, if there's demand, we can talk about uh, productizing it for external use, but right now it's just there, so you can see. In summary, everybody's favorite word in presentations, especially at the end of a conference. We address the following problems. Duplicate code, we address it primarily by creating a shared framework, and when we did that, we were able to build all these other things into the shared framework that made our DAG experience much better. And we did that again. We separated out the DSDAG framework from the site classification project, which separates out into its code, its config, and its SQLs. Before, we had over 100 files in our site classification project. And after, we have about 25, 25 files in our site classification project and another 25 or so in our DAG framework. And more importantly, there's, it's not a lot of duplicate code anymore. Now you can really go into any place and, and modify or change things. And again, we separated out the DAG framework, which is here. I need to shout out and thank the amazing people I'm privileged to work with every day and who helped a lot on this project and this presentation. And I hope you all caught Elad's amazing presentation two days ago. And thank you.